Uh, the reading this morning is from 1 Timothy chapter 5 to 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 2. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a woman, widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents for this, pleasure, pleasing, for this is pleasing to God. The widow, who is really in need and left all alone, puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead, even while she lives. Give the, give the people these instructions too, so that no one may be open to blame. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an, worse than an unbeliever. No widow may be put on a list of widows unless she's over 60, has been faithful to her husband and is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up her children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the saints, helping those in trouble and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. As for younger widows, do not put them on such a list, for when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Thus they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first pledge. Besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. And not, uh, not only do they become idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things they ought not to. So I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have in fact already turned away to follow Satan. If any woman who is a believer has widows in her family, she should help them and not let the church be burdened with them so that the church can help those widows who are really in need. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honour, especially those who work in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain and the worker deserves his wages. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. Those who sin are to be rebuked publicly so that the others may take warning. I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sin of others. Keep yourself pure. Stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and frequent illnesses. The sins of some men are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious and even those that are not cannot, that are not, cannot be hidden. All who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Those who, believe, those who have believing masters are not to show less respect for them because they are brothers. Instead, they are to serve them even better because those who benefit from their service are believers and dear to them. These are the things that you are to teach and urge on them. Right, let me pray. You ready? Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that's working in our hearts and minds right now to transform us so that we might be more like your son, Jesus. Uh, we pray that you'll help us do that. And in doing so, we will bring glory and honour to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
church, live what you believe. Uh, we've been thinking about Paul's trustworthy sayings, and Paul has made three, uh, three times in 1 Timothy trustworthy sayings. The first trustworthy saying was all about Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. The second trustworthy saying was all about eldership and those who uh, aspire to elder, aspire to a noble task. Why? Because it's all about character. It's all about setting the example for the church. Why the example for the church? Because the church is the pillar and the buttress of the truth. So through the church, people will see the invisible God. And through the church, people will know the truth. And so now we get to the third one. Here is a trustworthy saying that physical exercise or training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And so the rest of 1 Timothy chapter 4, 5, and 6 is all about this pursuit of godliness, asking the church and church members to pursue godliness. Why? Because they are the pillar and the buttress of the truth. Why? Because they reflect the living God to the world. The invisible God is seeing through the life of the church. So pursue godliness. More than anything else, pursue godliness. Why? Because it holds value for this life and the life to come. And so in chapter 5, uh, Paul begins to explain to Timothy what the value is in this life as redeemed people, redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ, as people who will follow Jesus' example, it will have benefits for you and me in the way we live, uh, in the way we organize ourselves, in the order and the structure of our life together. We will set an example that will bring blessing upon blessing upon blessing on each other that will be so attractive to a world that is just interested in itself, me, myself, I. And the problem, of course, is you and I, as we fight our own sinful nature, are quite often attracted to the me, myself, I lifestyle, right? But we are encouraged through the scriptures in the pursuit of godliness to set aside that kind of lifestyle and to pursue a different type of lifestyle. And our example, as stated in 1 Timothy chapter 3, is to pursue the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he holds the mystery of true godliness. The true godliness is actually revealed in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I forget what decade it was, but who recalls the WWJD uh, little things they used to... You could buy them as bracelets and all sorts of different things. Was, it, was that the 80s, 90s? 90s, right? The 90s. And what did it stand for? Exactly right. What would Jesus do? And we go, we think about it now and go, ugh, it's so horrible. Uh, who's still got one? Who's still wearing one? Thanks, Dean. That's right. Yeah. Um, we're, there's, a, there's a cringe factor to that now, isn't there? What would Jesus do? But the irony is that's exactly what Timothy is saying, uh, what Paul is saying to young Timothy. If you're going to pursue godliness, then have Jesus as your example. Uh, Jesus is the true godly man. And if you ever wanted to know how to treat people in the world you live in, just see what Jesus would do and follow that example. So the whole idea of WWJD is precisely the challenge for the Christian who has now received the Holy Spirit. Because the function of the Holy Spirit is to transform you more and more into the likeness of Jesus. And so that's exactly right that you reflect exactly Jesus in the way you think, act, whatever you do, what would Jesus do? And so as Paul now then speaks to young Timothy, who's a church leader, 
he wants to emphasize to young Timothy, this is what godliness looks like in the life of the church. And here's the first thing that's really important, that godliness has a sh social construct. Did you notice that? It has a social construct, which is really brilliant in the 21st century as we tear down all social constructs, right? So having this conversation with my son, I'm stop using my son as an example all the time. But anyway, um, he's not here, so it's fine. Um, don't tell him. <laughs> he was saying, I was asking him to do something, right? And he just bl bl blurted out. He said, I'm not going to. And I said, but I'm your father. And he said, but that's just a social construct, Dad. <laughs> and I was like, pack your bags and get on the street and see how you like that social construct. Anyway, the, it is challenging. And, and what's so important in the first century that Paul is saying is it's actually revolutionary in the concept of the first century where the culture is so taken up with itself and idol worship. It's all about self. It's not about community. It's not about caring for the most vulnerable in society. And, and yet in the 21st century, we are heading down that same path. When we can have laws in relation to abortion as we do around the world, when we can have laws about euthanasia now, our senior citizens watch out because we'll just inject you when we're tired of you and we'll take your money and your land and everything else. It, it, it's, it's funny, but it's not funny, right? Because that's how it works. It's all about me and what I need. It's not about caring for society and the needs of the wider society. It's not about making sacrifices for anybody else. It's about getting what you want now and taking it now. That's the culture we live in. And yet Paul is saying to young Timothy, no, no, no. There, if we are going to pursue godliness, there is a social construct to godliness. And here it is. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if, you, if he were your father. Treat a younger man as a brother or an older woman as a mother, a younger woman as a sister with absolute purity. Back in the good old days when I used to run youth ministry, I would always have this talk with the young men that came to church because I didn't trust any of them. And the reason I didn't trust any of them is because the only reason they were coming to youth group on a Friday night was to pick up a chick. Was to, sorry, can I use that word? Was to find a girlfriend. That's the only reason they came on a Friday night because they heard that youth group had nice girls. And so they came on a Friday. And then I would sit them down with this passage as a sort of an introductory to coming to youth group. And I would say, all the women in our church, whether they're older or you're younger, if they're older, treat them as your mum. And if they're younger, treat them as your sister. Now tell me, would you French kiss your mum or your sister? So leave my girls alone. Did you get it? There's a social construct. And with it comes an order and a structure of how we relate to one another, of how we treat each other, of the dignity and the respect we have for each other. And that is what Paul is saying to young Timothy, is what godliness looks like in the church. That when you are confronted with older ladies, you treat them as your mum. And when you are confronted with older men, you treat them like your dad. And younger men as your brothers. And younger girls as your sisters. And with it comes privilege and responsibility. With it comes order, structure, design. You see it? And that's what the church is. This church is being brought together by Christ and we are a family and that is the social construct that Paul 
is kind of suggesting the church is founded upon its foundation stones that we are a family and so we treat family members the way they should be treated now of course I, I'm not naive. There's always the danger when we pursue this notion of a social construct of a family. There's always the problem that your personal experience doesn't live up to the ideal. Perhaps you had an absent father. Perhaps you had an abusive mother. Perhaps you hated your siblings. I get it. I gets and takes, attains everything, but it doesn't change the principle of what God has established and what God is trying to bring together. The order and the structure and the design that God has brought together is designed around the notion of family. We are family. And that's the way we should behave as family members. So in our pursuit of godliness, can you see how difficult it is? I have trouble just with one mum. Don't you? Or is it just me? I have trouble respecting just one father. It's hard work. But that's what you and I are called to. We're called to live a life that is so different, that is so countercultural in the way we order ourselves, in the way we treat each other, in the way we have respect for each other. The, the second thing uh, Paul wants to highlight to young Timothy is the pursuit of godliness doesn't have a, only a social construct but it also has a social concern. That is, it has a social care. That is the way we live as Christians profoundly impacts each other's lives and can profoundly impact the world that we live in. And so from verse three all the way through to verse 16, Paul is spelling out what that social care looks like in how we care for each other. And uh, he's challenged to the widows in the church and how we are to care for widows and orphans uh, and what we're supposed to provide for widows and orphans. And more to the point, how we're supposed to uh, uh, determine who gets onto the list of caring for widows and orphans. Do you notice that? Did you love the play between older women and, and younger women? And um, did you like the language? Is it, did you find the language slightly offensive? Uh, particularly the younger ladies. Did you did you find that kind of offensive? Yeah, lazy, busy bodies, gossipers. Do you, <laughs> do, do you like the language? It's horrible, isn't it? Uh, and yet Paul is speaking into the context and he is saying quite clearly that the first thing that you need to notice is that we must care for the most vulnerable. We must support the most vulnerable in our church family. Don't miss the point that there is a list you and I want to spend our time focusing on who's not on the list and get cranky about who's not on the list. But the point that Paul is making is that there is a list. If we are going to pursue godliness, if we are going to be like Jesus, then we must have a social conscience. We must care for the most vulnerable in our society. And so when someone says to me in the life of the church, we need to buy chairs with arms things, the natural thing I want to say is, no, that costs too much money. <laughs> but when someone explains to me that they actually can't get out of the chair, 
because they need a walking stick and they need something to balance on to get out of the chair so that they don't fall and break the hip and die. Then I need to have a social concern. And we need to provide those chairs. It's wonderful when that same person actually pays for the chairs. That's just awesome. Anyway, <laughs> fantastic. Um, if we're going to pursue godliness, we must have a social conscience. The church must care for the vulnerable, for those in need. Interesting that Paul does want to say, though, that there are limitations. There are limitations to the care we can provide as a church. And the first thing he wants to say about it is this, that the ultimate responsibility of care must fall back on the family. That's the first point he wants to make. He wants to say to all Christians gathered, that it is your responsibility to care for your own family. That is a mark of Christianity. That is a mark of being faithful. If you will not care for your own family members, then you are like an unbeliever who is just preoccupied with yourself. And he's saying in the Christian life, in our society, in our Christian world, we want to say first and foremost that you have the responsibility as a Christian to care for your own family. So when was the last time you called mum? Or dad? When was the last time you caught up with your brother or your sister? I know there are lots of reasons you don't. I know all the excuses in the world. But they are your family and your Christian witness is to show them love and care and support. So Paul challenges Christians and says, the church, we are to care. But the church has limitations in its care. That the church does not usurp the responsibility of the family. And by the way, it's not the state's responsibility to care for your family. We've tried that through the centuries and that has failed too, hopelessly. When we give the state the responsibility for caring for our family members, for our children who are disabled, for our parents who are frail. A royal commission into aged care. Did you glimpse the report? Did you look over it? Did you pour over it in detail? It is shocking the way we treat our elderly members of our society. It's not the state's fault. It's our fault for not caring for our family members. It's our responsibility. It's your responsibility. Care for your family. And do not show partiality. Don't show favoritism. Paul says to young Timothy, just treat everybody equally and fairly and care for those who are most vulnerable. And for those who just need encouragement to get up and to get going again, walk beside them, provide them the support. If necessary, give them a kick up the pants but get them going again. And that is not just true for young women. That is true for all. 
including young men. Men, get out of bed, pull up your pants and go to work. Same is true for young women, right? That's what's so interesting about what Paul is talking about in this context of the first century is that he's asking young women to be productive, to be productive and creative and innovative and get on with providing for the family. In other words, he's giving young women the opportunity to work, to get on with it, rather than to be idle. Social welfare. If we are godly, we will have a concern for social welfare. But we'll know its limitations. And then finally, Paul says, if we're going to pursue godliness, we don't pursue godliness only in our social constructs and our social welfare, but also godliness is seen in servant leadership. Do you notice uh, what he says about uh, the elder in verse 17? The elder who directs the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those who work in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. There it is. Pay me double. And why would you pay me double? Because I've got to treat all you older blokes as my fathers. And I've got to treat all you older ladies as my mothers. And that is worth double. Don't you think? Don't you think? Come on. Have some sympathy for me. Let me say personally, Sydney Anglican Diocese provides for its clergy exceptionally well. We are well provided for. But let me just make this comment. We are not the Roman Catholic Church. It's not some diocesan organization that pays my wage, my stipend. Not a wage, by the way. It's a stipend because it's a lifestyle. You keep me in a certain lifestyle. Don't you like that? A lifestyle where I can ride a Porsche, fly first class. No, that's not true. (laughs) The lifestyle, the reason it's a stipend is so that you graciously provide me with the opportunity. And this is profound and humbling. You provide me with the opportunity to spend the majority of my time in God's word and coming here week by week trying to faithfully teach you God's word. And that's the most wonderful privilege in my life. And it doesn't come from a diocese. It comes from what you put in the offertory plate or what you put through the electronic banking. There's, there's no head office paying my stipend. You, the local church, provide me with my stipend and provide me with my way of life. And I'm profoundly, both me and my family, profoundly well, well off and well looked after. And I want to thank you for that. But there are others who abuse what Paul says. Sadly, there are other church leaders flying first class, riding around in expensive cars and motorbikes. And I made mention of them last week and said, I didn't sort of name them, but they are charlatans. They are workers of evil. They are the workers of the devil. Because they stand up and preach 
but for their own personal gain. Godliness is seen in servant-hearted leadership. And that's what Paul calls here. He says to young Timothy that you are worthy of a double honor. And then he says to the church, look after your spiritual leaders. And as you look after your spiritual leaders, make sure no allegations are brought against them unless you have one or two witnesses. Why? Because it's all about not competency, but character. And how easy is it to destroy someone's character? Yeah? It's easy to destroy someone's character. And if you destroy the person's character, they've got nothing to say. And that's why Paul puts it in here. And he says, treat your spiritual leaders well. Look after them financially. And don't allow gossip and slander to take over the church in relation to your Christian leader. Protect them from that. But at the same time, if there is sin in a person's life, in a church leader's life, make it public. That's why it's an interesting kind of thing I do. I dedicate my life to teaching God's word and you support me in that ministry and you protect me in that ministry. But when I fall over, it is public for everybody to see. Because it's all about character. It's interesting, isn't it? In your workplace, unless you perhaps work in a Christian organization, It's very seldom about character, is it? If you have an affair, you don't lose your job. Yeah? But in my line of work, I do. Because it's all about character. But it's more than just about character. It's about the name of God and not bringing the name of God into disrepute. That's what what matters most. And when Christians fall and Christian leaders fall, they bring the name of God into disrepute. And we've all experienced that over the years. Notice Paul doesn't just have a word to Christian leaders, but he has a word also in relation to servant-hearted leadership to those in the workforce. It's a really challenging section, this verse, chapter 6, verses 1 through to 2, uh, where, where, where Paul is saying nothing about whether he condones um, slavery or not. But isn't it interesting how he speaks into the context of slavery? And he says to slaves, honor your masters. And he says to masters, treat your slaves respectfully. Treat them well. Why? Again, because it's all about the reputation of God. You see it there in verse 1? All who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect so that God's name and your teaching may not be slandered. So not only is it important in the Christian context, in Christian leadership, that there's no sense of slander because of the name of God, it's also true in the workplace. It's also true when you go out into the workplace and do whatever it is you do in the workplace, that the way you work, that the way you speak about your employer, that the way you speak about your boss 
says something not only about you, but says something about the very character and nature of God. Isn't that interesting? So it's not just about how you and I behave in the church. It's so important how you behave in the world, how you work, your work ethic, what you do when you stand around the waterhole talking to other staff members, how you give your time, how you show respect to those in authority over you. Of course, there's a responsibility then for Christian leaders. If you have a high-flying position, if you are a manager, a director, a CEO, there's a responsibility that God has given you of how you treat people who are made in the very image of God. That you treat them with dignity, that you treat them with respect, and fairness and that you honor them can you see how what Paul is doing here in this context of chapter 5 and how he's setting out for you and me a pursuit of godliness that godliness has a social construct that godliness has a social concern and that godliness has servant-hearted leadership how he's actually setting out for you and me a pattern of life not only within the context of the church, but in the context of the world that you and I engage with. And when you and I put these principles in place, it will turn the world upside down. Because it's incredibly attractive. It had just that effect in the first century. And I believe it will have the same effect in the 21st century. If you will work hard at living what you believe, at pursuing godliness, because it benefits you and me in this life and the life to come. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity we've had this morning to reflect on what it means to be godly. Uh, please help us um, in the way we live uh, to pursue godliness. Please, Father, won't you help us live as a family? Please help us to be people not only who live as a family, but have a social concern for one another. Please help us to care for the most vulnerable in our church. And, Father, please help us to live well whether we are workers or managers, please help us to live in such a way that brings honor and glory to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our final song together.